right, so uh, for those of you who are joining us uh, live, which is fewer of you than there were going to be, um, uh, I'm Clifford Mitchell, and I am the Assistant Director for Environmental Health and Food Protection at the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Uh, this is a uh, broadcast of the uh, Mid-Atlantic Public Health Training Center's uh, Grand Round Series, which is a collaboration between uh, Johns Hopkins, Bloomberg School of Public Health, and the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Uh, it's being recorded because uh, we've had some technical difficulties with the live broadcast. but. Uh, we are going to go ahead and uh, uh, have this available for distribution, and you should be able to see it um, in its entirety. Um, this Grand Rounds is uh, timely and topical. It is on information systems and health information uh, systems interoperability and public health. Um, it's a particularly timely topic because under the Affordable Care Act uh, and the larger enterprise known as health care reform, uh, Health information technology plays a central, critical, pivotal role in uh, moving the healthcare enterprise, both public health and clinical healthcare, uh, into the 21st century. Uh, a number of initiatives at the federal level, uh, including the High Tech Act and then uh, subsequently the Affordable Care Act, are changing the landscape for uh, information technology and its use in clinical care, in patient decision making, clinical decision making, and most importantly, the ability of the healthcare system and the public health system to use and share and exchange data related to the health of individuals and populations. Uh, the purpose of this Grand Rounds is to discuss what are the implications of these changes for public health and the public health enterprise uh, here in the United States. And uh, to frame this a little, it's important for uh, all of us to think about what the public health system currently does as far as informatics is concerned and data exchange. Uh, in many cases, what we do is we, are, we have a series of public health surveillance systems that typically rely on either active or passive reporting by the healthcare system to the public health system. In many cases, it consists of an individual provider who fills out a little card or goes online and submits a report to the healthcare system about a reportable condition, whether it's communicable disease or cancer. But all of that actually requires that somebody do something at the clinical service end uh, in order to initiate a report, which then goes to the public health receiver of that information who can consume that information and use it. Um, in many cases, other surveillance systems looking at public health parameters have to rely on passive uh, uh, collection of data, for example, weights, cholesterol levels, et cetera, and then find a way to access those data, again, by somehow gaining entry or permission to have the data transferred to the public health system. In a new world, uh, the new world of health information exchanges, uh, which you'll hear a great deal about this hour, um, think of a public health system in which rather than uh, having to passively wait for data to be transferred somehow to the public health department, uh, physicians, healthcare providers, healthcare systems, hospitals, and others um, are, as they develop clinical information, whether it's laboratory information, clinical information, demographic information, that information is, if you will, will being shared uh, on health information exchanges in a way in which potentially the, uh, if the conditions are flagged or if they have flags attached to them, the public health department or the public health provide or the public health service can actually query, if you will, the data as it is floating through the exchange in a way in which you could not, no longer have to depend on an individual uh, to generate a report, but instead could actually look live at cholesterol levels because you uh, can actually look at population cholesterol as they are transferring through the health information exchange. Or reports of cancer now which have to be uh, uh, actively transferred to the Maryland Cancer Registry by way of a tumor registrar 
uh, could instead, as diagnoses are and, and clinical services are being provided, could potentially now be extracted using web services or other kinds of services, could be extracted from the health information exchange and uh, subsequently be, be uh, available for the registry. It's really, in some ways, a fundamentally different way of looking at public health data and its relationship to the public health en enterprise. Um, so today's discussion is going to focus on the mechanics, the logistics, uh, some of the, I hope, what will be the legal technical issues as well uh, involved, and importantly, the use of standards by which all of this would have to operate in order for it to be realistically uh, available. Um, and our two speakers are going to address that. Uh, before we begin, however, a couple of notes. First of all, uh, a thank you to Johns Hopkins and Bloomberg School of Public Health uh, for uh, hosting this series of Grand Rounds. Um, if you have questions about this, because this is being recorded and not available uh, live, uh, you will, you'll not be able to send in email requests, but uh, you can certainly visit the website, which is uh, uh, www.jhsph.edu uh, uh, slash maphtc. Um, and we have a series of grand rounds coming up. Uh, on March 16th, uh, we will be dealing with uh, immunization and healthcare workers, uh, recommendations and challenges. Uh, subsequently, um, uh, we will be dealing with a number of other um, uh, issues, uh, including environmental health, and the Mid-Atlantic Public Health Training Center also has a number of trainings for uh, uh, healthcare providers and the public health workforce, including community assessment and formative evaluations and outbreak investigation fundamentals. So um, uh, we look forward to seeing you at those events. Um, let me give you brief, uh, an, a brief introduction to our two speakers, uh, starting with Dr. Uh, Anna Orlova. Uh, Dr. Orlova is a visiting associate professor at the Division of Health Sciences Informatics at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and is an associate at the Bloomberg School of Public Health. She's also a clinical uh, associate professor at the School of Public Health and Health Sciences in the University of Massachusetts um, and is a member of the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine Executive Committee for the National Library of Medicine's training program on health sciences informatics. Um, uh, Dr. Orlova started her uh, informatics career at the All Union Institute of Scientific and Technical Information in Moscow, Russia, where she led the development of large scale information systems on industrial wastes. Uh, and her more recent work has focused on electronic health record systems and the creation of public health data standards uh, for those systems. We are also joined uh, by Mr. Daniel Wilt. Uh, Mr. Wilt is the program director for the Healthcare IT Regional Extension Center for uh, CRISP, uh, the Chesapeake Regional Information Service for our patients, uh, which he will tell you more, more about in a minute. Uh, he brings more than 15 years of experience with implementing electronic health records and the healthcare um, uh, uh, informatics um, and has been instrumental in taking the program uh, for health information exchange here in Maryland from a concept to a functional delivery system by partnering with healthcare IT companies. Um, before it, uh, he was at CRISP, he was at Care First Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, as an enterprise architect um, where he worked on the primary care medical uh, home pay for performance system and the payer-based personal health records initiative. Um, and he has also served as vice president for information technology uh, at Ericsson Health Systems. So uh, we're going to go ahead and start with Dr. Orlova and her presentation and uh, then go immediately to Mr. Wilt. Dr. Orlova, thank you for being with us. Good afternoon and thank you so much for joining this session. It is a great honor for me to talk to you today about the topic that um, um, several of us in public health community has been working for the last uh, five, seven years very intensely. Though I cannot just uh, share with you uh, um, a lot of successes uh, with that, but it's more like lessons learned and how we'll go about it in the future. Uh, the title of this presentation, Health Information Systems Interoperability and Public Health, in fact, I believe should be revised. There should be comma after health information systems, because today there is no interoperability between health information systems 
between clinical system and public health system. We're just in the process of building it. And I hope that in the nearest future, like in five years, we will be presenting here for this audience about the way we enabled health information system interoperability and the public health became an integral part of this exchange of information. Today, I will talk to you about three um, topics, national initiatives that are, are supporting this uh, tendency to develop health information systems um, interoperability, public health and where we are with health information technology adoption right now and what lessons learned and challenges we have in integrating our systems in, with the clinical world. And we we'll talk uh, a little bit about this notion of public health reporting, which is today considered to be one of the uh, most uh, known, at least for the outside of public health world, of what public health does. Public health collects reports. We believe that uh, in this work that we will be doing, this notion of public health uh, serving as a reporting agency will change to become an agency that participates in care coordination in effective preparedness for any outbreaks that may be happening in the community that helps uh, clinicians practice uh, the, the um, care delivery in the community oriented way and uh, what's more importantly this all cannot be done without people like you in this audience who are involved in public health practice and those who are just at Johns Hopkins side are entering this practice as we speak Okay, let's talk about national initiatives, and we have to go back uh, into May 27th, 2004. That's when all these initiatives started, when the President Bush signed the executive order number 13335. 13, this uh, order, uh, was focused on developing and nationally implementing an interoperable health information technology infrastructure that ensures appropriate information to guide medical decisions, improve healthcare quality, reduce medical errors, reduce healthcare costs resulting from the inefficiency of information exchanges, promote a more effective marketplace and greater competition and increase choice through wider availability of accurate information on healthcare cost, quality, and outcomes, improve coordination of care and information about, among hospitals, laboratories, physicians' office, ambulatory care providers, and lastly, ensures patient individually identifiable health information is secured and protected. Did you see public health or population health mentioned here? Not yet. Under this order, the Office of National Coordinator for Health Information Technology has been created within the Department of Health and Human Services, and this is the URL that you can find information about this office. Since 2004, we had um, three national coordinator, Dr. Brela, who started it all in 2004. He was replaced by uh, Dr. Eric Kolodner from Veteran Administration Affairs, uh, who was then replaced by Dr. Blumenthal, who was leading Office of National Coordinator during the President Obama administration, and who is leaving in April 2011, going back to his academic career at Har uh, Harvard. So we're kind of right now in the way uh, that we have an uh, initiative that may be losing its leader. I don't think this will actually uh, true about losing the momentum that this initiative created since 2004. The document where the uh, national U.S. Um, health information strategy has been described was published on July 21st, 2004. And when Dr. Brailler presented at the first meeting, uh, actually it wasn't the first meeting, but there was their first meeting where in fact every agency stood up and said that they're committed to, um, um, to work on this um, um, common health, strategic health IT plan. And that's where the notion of national health information network has been first announced. 
It's supposed to be a network of regional health information exchanges formed by healthcare providers who will be using electronic health record systems. The word national within a year been changed to the nation nationwide, and that's how it's uh, known right now, nationwide health information network. The reason for the change was because national sound very centralized. And uh, in fact, the um, idea is not to build the centralized database of uh, health records uh, across the nation, but support um, integration of um, information systems through interoperability. Okay, what are we building? What, what is just uh, will be happening when uh, by 2014, that was the goal uh, for the President Bush to have this nationwide health and information network to be uh, up and running. What this network will do for us? It's supposed to be a regional health information organization, uh, which is uh, an organization that is running health information exchange that uh, runs a particular hospital where you happen to come for care. Your information may reside in on the healthcare, uh, may uh, reside in this particular area, number one, or you could just present for care into another hospital, like outside of this state, in another area. Okay, let's just take this example when another area becoming your point of encounter. So this another area sends inquiry for your health data to the area that is just administering your data um, based, for example, on your residence. This um, uh, request goes through the master patient index to identify you as a participant of the health information exchange within this area. And uh, they try, the system calls for your records in the other various systems, such as provider record, laboratory, or any specialty information systems. This information comes back to uh, the health information exchange where it's organized in the temporary aggregate patient history that's sent back to the um, uh, electronic health record system where you've been um, seen for care temporarily. If you look at the date when this picture was created, it is September 2004. And I believe if you will look through the slides on the Office of National Coordinator uh, presentations, you still will see the same um, explanation of what this uh, nationwide health information network will do for you as a patient or a provider in this case. So the vision is that in 2014, we will have something like that, which will consist of the regional health information exchanges administered uh, by regional health information organizations. And within each bubble, you see there are the numeral hospitals that are connected, and within the hospital there are many departments, and so forth and so forth, and a a every last dot on this slide eventually is supposed to have electronic health uh, record system or ability to communicate with electronic health record system. All done in secure, and our way uh, also protecting patient privacy and confidentiality. Okay. When all this stuff started uh, in, back in 2004, you notice that in fact in the executive order, public health has not been mentioned. And uh, later on, there were this on the several initiatives under eHealth Initiative, which is um, NGO that uh, in fact contributed a lot in the development of this vision. The first time the public health happened to uh, be listed as a, a, a potential player, I wouldn't say equal player, but at least potential um, player, when John Glazer uh, was in his presentation mentioning there are data emerging and data shows the value of these exchanges. For, of course, payers first, for healthcare providers, for laboratories, participating clinicians, and public health. So we in the Public Health Data Standards Consortium, the organization that I'm directing, uh, decided just immediately to build up on this momentum. So we included wh how, what we're doing right now and what um, um, experience we're bringing to the table if we're part of this health information exchange. These two slides that follows 
is just I included here just uh, to reiterate why we're building a nationwide health information uh, network. So we're supposed to have consumer-centric healthcare means patient-centric healthcare, which will be used technology that will assure privacy and security of information exchanges. It will enhance public health operation and population health assessments that will allow uh, clinicians to practice in community-oriented way. It will expand uh, and improve uh, health literacy and education for um, both providers and patients so that accelerating health knowledge diffusion, improving translation of knowledge into practice, and be able for patients to become active participants in their care. The Nationwide Health Information Network created a lot of acronyms. Uh, the focus was on interoperable health information technology infrastructure to support electronic exchange of clinical information. The word interoperability first surfaced in 2004, which is, in fact, it didn't have even a definition. There were many other terms surfaced in this initiative that didn't have definition at that time and still were still working on trying to figure out what is the difference between electronic health record and patient electronic medical record and patient medical record and clinical information system. Some um, abbreviations such as HIE, Health Information Exchange, Health Information Technology, Original Health Information Organization, HIN, Nationwide Health Information Network, didn't change much since 2004. However, we begin seeing new acronyms such as REX, Regional Extension Center, Beacon Communities, and others created under the Obama administration a way of continuing to advance this agenda. Interoperability is defined as ability of different technology systems and software applications to communicate, to exchange data accurately, effectively, and consistently, and to use information that has been exchanged. So this is the definition that applies to this presentation as well as uh, in general for uh, the operations that Office of National Coordinator right now is leading. Under the President Obama administration, uh, as Cliff already mentioned, there were several uh, initiatives that advanced this uh, nationwide health information network development, and it, st it started with the ERA um, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009. And under this ERA Act, there are several initiatives being created, such as meaningful use of health IT, high-tech programs, private security and health IT, standards and certification, certification and testing. The meaningful use of health IT is uh, something that everybody is uh, now talking about, uh, shows uh, that uh, the nationwide health information network will be built in increments, in stages like meaningful use stage one, stage two, and stage three. The um, implementation deadline was moved from 2014 to 2016. I don't really show how this is realistic, but that's what it is right now. And if you look at the uh, listing of, um, um, we call it an informatics use cases, but it's, in fact it is different programs or particular area of healthcare that are included in this stage approach. Uh, we were very happy to see that public health is also included. In stage one, you see here e-prescribing, lab results sent to electronic health record, and public health um, um, agencies, immunization, uh, exchange, uh, sending the immunization data to public health agency from providers, uh, EHR also is part of stage one, and syndromic surveillance is a part of stage one. What's very important is also quality reporting added for stage one, but there are no use cases or presence right now uh, on public health behalf in advancing quality reporting. As I said, this uh, we're very, very uh, happy that three domains are included in the agenda for meaningful use, and everything will be great unless there is this uh, no, um, statement which is... Uh, present in the current regulation, that these systems can be populated with data from electronic uh, health record if 
public health can accept them. And that if is making our presence, presence a very um, challenging because we, in fact, want to be a real participant in the exchange. In this presentation, I will not be saying you why if is becoming so important uh, and why uh, right now um, electronic health record system could be certified for meaningful use only by sending data without somebody receiving it. It's a topic for another discussion and it um, bring, would, would have to bring me in this complicated world, world of standards that I don't think it's appropriate just to talk about right now, but I would like to talk to you about where this if coming from and how we in public health is in fact responsible for having this if notion in the regulation today. Um, let me just uh, show you uh, a few slides about current uh, health IT adoption in public health. Where are we now? This school may be not uh, very familiar with that because uh, a focus of our school and the pride of our school is this great research that our professors and students are doing. But today, public health is doing a lot of work that relates to direct care, especially at the local level. Public health is known as a healthcare provider for underserved population. Public health is also a laboratory, it's purchaser and payer. It is a pharmacy. And uh, from what you see here on that slide, this publicly de delivered direct care makes us no different from the uh, um, electronic health record systems uh, used uh, as it's supposed to be used in the clinical care in the private um, institutions like Johns Hopkins. Moreover, uh, usually this clinic, community health centers or federal qualified clinics uh, for underserved population, uh, they're funded by HRSA and uh, it's a different agency from the Office of National Coordinator and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and they have their own input in how the electronic health record will be penetrating in these clinics and they are active players in just trying to enhance this agenda. So. If we will just forget about or just uh, forget about this direct care role that public health is playing and focus only on the agency and the research component of public health, I would like to show you the way we are using our information technology nowadays. So uh, our core functions if for the agency level for public health surveillance, for example, is assessment, policy development and assurance and there are state, local, and federal health department, and all our work in this department is mostly organized by particular disease-specific programs. This slide shows you the organizational chart of average health department. You see these lines uh, listed in these groups? Each of them is particular program, which utilizes today particular health information system, so public health information system, or registry, or access database, or something that needs to be connected in, in this health information exchange under the nationwide health information network. This is some math for you um, that I would like just to show. There are two uh, studies that we found, and sorry that I didn't provide you the references for them. Actually, I have to do it, and I will update the slide. There are two um, uh, surveys that being conducted that shows that on average, a local health department has 23 uh, various programs and state health department up to 19 different programs. That's been immunization, chronic disease management, infectious diseases, TB, STD, and so forth. There are 3,000 local health department and 50 state health department in the United States. Just do the math. There are 70,000 standalone legacy public health information uh, systems that needs to be connected, integrated in the health information exchanges at their jurisdictional level and in the national level. And today, meaningful use includes just three programs out of those uh, that uh, we are uh, actually having in our pool to, collect, to connect. 
all these programs support our programmatic needs today, and all these programs used data from the systems that are standalone and non-interoperable. This notion about um, building integrated public health information systems was not new. And in fact, I believe it's healthcare that getting into this information exchange and interoperability only recently, but public health uh, been trying just to integrate their systems for quite some time nowadays. And we will see in the next slides that in fact, we could just bring a, a lot of experience of how we build the integration, why we're not always successful in what we try to deliver, and what lessons we learn from that. And those states uh, where public health is integral participant uh, of this health information, emerging health information exchanges, they could really benefit from our experience. This notion of public health reporting means sending data from clinical care to public health on a particular condition or a particular area of interest for public health is something that is required by jurisdiction-specific regulation. When we're talking about uh, public health reporting, we're always thinking about CDC 62 or 65 nowadays uh, notifiable conditions. But each state may expand this list to what's called reportable conditions. And in um, California, for example, there are 3,000 conditions that has to be reported from clinical care to public health. That's how we're doing reporting right now. Clinicians send data to various programs at the local health department. Then he sends the same data to various programs different programs at the um, uh, state health department, all these paper-based, all these using the different forms uh, that they have to uh, um, populate all the time with redundant information. And we're also even asking them to send data to federal agencies directly from um, physician practices. That's how, in fact, it looks. No wonder that reporting is only at 49% today. This is because physicians don't know how to report, don't know what to report, when to report, and what forms to use to report, or they don't trust uh, this whole operation of reporting. The interoperability and nationwide health information network will bring totally different approach on how this reporting will be viewed. When CDC back in early days talked about the um, information system integration. At that time, interoperability was not a topic. And this is the list of initiatives. 1950, MedInfo, 1992, National Electronic Disease Surveillance System, 2003, Public Health Information Network, 2003, Environmental Public Health Tracking Network, and 2005, CDC Biosense System. That's all the initiatives that we were trying to launch in public health to connect, integrate our systems. Some states, also tried to do that, and this is a diagram, which is usually we use in informatics just to document integration across systems. What's the problem? Why we didn't succeed? What's wrong with this diagram from the state of Utah that shows the integrated healthcare advanced record management system? Where are data coming from here? They sent from physicians on paper forms, by foxes, or uh, by phone calls. That's the problem, that all our attempts were to integrate public health within the public health, when in fact, it should be integrated outside of the public health. How are we going to do it? In 2005, there was uh, this attempt at uh, showcase, uh, interoperability showcase at Health Information Management and Systems Society, when showed that uh, how interoperability can occur when the hospital doesn't send anything to the health department anymore directly, but this information can be channeled through this health information exchange that you see uh, on the middle, and each program po uh, populates uh, their data, uh, whatever they need to populate for to advance the um, operation. This picture, in fact, will be replaced by that picture. When the standard-based approach is used and the various data standards allow uh, used um, cohesively across different systems would allow this interoperability. One day, 
we will have it built this way. And one of the dots, I don't know, purple or green, will be our public health dots. And maybe then we will be able in real time to generate a picture like this, bloodlet testing across the United States from all 50 states. Today, we cannot get this picture in real time. So that's where we're going. I think it's pretty exciting. Thank you very much, Dr. Arlova. So um, uh, for those of you who have just joined us, uh, we are now live. Uh, and so we are going to go for the full length of this uh, uh, presentation till 1.30. Uh, so uh, if you do have questions online, please send them to maphtc at jhsph.edu. Uh, and uh, we will take the questions. So now we're going to hear from uh, Mr. Daniel Wilt about uh, Maryland's implementation of health information exchanges through uh, CRISP. Hello and uh, welcome uh, to a uh, presentation about CRISP. Uh, CRISP uh, is the state HIE, uh, Health Information Exchange, and also the Regional Extension Center for Maryland. And so I'll go through our history and talk about what we're doing within the state of Maryland and how that's going, uh, proceeding along the way. So CRISP uh, was, is the regional, uh, is the Health Information Exchange and Regional Extension Center. So the Health Information Exchange was funded uh, through uh, the state and federal grants, the federal grant for the REC program, and so they kind of uh, coalesce and work well together that these two programs are helping each other to achieve uh, getting physician practices uh, connected to the HIA along with working with large institutions and getting the hospitals connected through uh, CRISP at this point. So our mission statement is to advance health and wellness for Marylanders. Uh, we're all about healthcare IT. So we're an organization that's focused around health and IT together. Uh, we exist to facilitate cooperation. Uh, if you th look at the founding members of our organization, which is Johns Hopkins, uh, it's uh, MedStar, it's uh, University of Maryland Medical System, and then Erickson uh, Living Management. Those four, uh, those four organizations came together uh, in a non-compete type way. They wanted to collaborate, they wanted to work together, they wanted to be able to collaborate and provide data amongst their own uh, pieces, and we've actually grown that past the, those four groups, and we have over 40 organizations that are actually working with us in some way or form. Uh, so we really want to be a technology enabler, uh, and we don't want to compete on exchanging data uh, the services you provide around that, uh, that's where the competition should be, and we should be impartial in the fact that we should be able to provide this health information uh, in uh, cooperative ways. So guiding principles for, for Chris, uh, we're definitely about remaining incremental, and so for us, uh, we're in, implement, increment from there, uh, state, uh, create opportunities for cooperation, and we've have done that with the four organizations that are there, but also 40 more organizations that help to do this. Um, Use the market mechanisms for innovation. So we're very much about uh, free marketeers and the fact that we want the market to help innovate on top of what we're doing from the base kind of utility stuff that we do for the HIE pieces. Uh, enable consumer controls. Uh, that one's a little bit more difficult in the, in the short term, but in the long term that we are absolutely about enabling the consumer to be able to control the stuff that they have within uh, the HIE itself. Uh, be flexible. I think that's one of the key things that uh, as an HIE, you have to be very flexible in the fact that you are bound by what you have available to you. And so being able to adapt and to uh, work with those organizations as they are being uh, put into place. Uh, use best practices and obviously standards where, uh, wherever possible. So that's main main uh, core piece of that. And then obviously we want to serve the entire Maryland healthcare community. And so uh, we want to work with all organizations, uh, physicians, any healthcare uh, pieces of the puzzle. <coughs> so, uh, so getting started, really, we, we, pursue, uh, we pursued uh, the federal HIE and REC funding and received both of those funds. Uh, we built out a basic, uh, within the first year, built a basic organizational structure and governance infrastructure. And so I'll talk about the governance infra infrastructure, which is uh, how we actually involve a whole bunch of different people. Uh, identify a war of the technology. So we had to go through a selection process to actually pick a technology that we could use to be able to build the HIE and then start to implement. So this is where we're at now as we've gotten through the selection, but I'll talk about how we got there and identify additional use cases. So we're continually looking at additional use cases and how we could evolve the HIE's capabilities past what we initially got started with. And so we'll go through those pieces. Uh, so we received $10 million in funding from the state of Maryland. 
uh, who's heavily investing in this HIE technology. And, they're ha and the federal government's investing $9 million into this technology. And so we think that uh, it makes sense that if the federal and the state governments are buying and paying for this technology and helping to make sure that you get connected up, um, those organizations should participate with us. And we're trying to make it way ways in which we're very flexible and easy to work with. Uh, but uh, think about if you uh, this public private partnership has will spend $20 million into getting the infrastructure ready to go. Uh, organizations that think about how they can leverage that, that technology uh, because it is a uh, it's open and free uh, initially to everyone. And then though obviously we'll have to build our sustainability model. But initially, this is uh, a huge investment from the state and federal government. And also, the Regional Extension Center received $6.4 $6 million to get uh, small practices, 10 and fewer. This is practices that are really small, which is 80% of the practices in Maryland, get them on electronic. And if we can't get the last mile of the physician in that small office electronic and be able to connect to the HIE, uh, we've missed a whole bunch of our primary care physicians and a, and a good amount of those that deliver health care uh, in the metro metropolitan areas, but also in the non-metropolitan areas. You think about Western uh, Maryland or Southern Maryland or Eastern Shore, uh, you know, we need to get those, uh, those physicians connected too. And if we don't get them connected, and only, the only thing we do get connected is, say, hospitals and large organizations, that it still isn't, they're, they're definitely growing the number of connected entities, but there are lots of entities that need to, to have this access. And that's where the REC program is really focused on making sure that we get that done. So our governance structure is, is a bit complex. Um, so we have, up at the top, we have the MHCC Policy Board, which is the Maryland Healthcare Commission is setting, uh, working with a, a group of constituents to set policies around HIEs in the state of Maryland, how they should operate, what types of privacy security uh, provisions they should have in the place, who is allowed to do certain types of things. And so we look to that board to help guide us uh, to what things are acceptable for here in Maryland. And that's a very important board for us, and we, we think that they're doing a great job of getting through some very difficult conversations around who, how privacy should happen, what authentication methods are there. They've passed four of their policies of 20 plus they have to get through. And so this is a really, uh, really good group that's really contemplating what are the, what are the impacts uh, from their perspective on how that this, if we're able to share data, how would that impact, affect the public? We have the Maryland Healthcare Commission, which is really an uh, important partner for us. Uh, the State Office of Health IT uh, with David Sharp and Rex Calgary have been uh, great uh, proponents of technology and healthcare adoption within the state. Uh, they hold the primary uh, grant for the HIE. Uh, they are a strong partner on the REC side. Uh, we also have the Health Services Cost Review Commission, which is where we got our funding from, uh, from the state level. So we, we tapped into the state's uh, single payer uh, concept and be able to, to get the grant to us. We also have the uh, HHS Office of National Coordinator. They, uh, they awarded us directly, Chris, the REC grant. And so uh, we have uh, a lot of interactions with ONC. Uh, and then we also have our, chi our, chi our CRISP uh, Board of Directors, which is made up of the four founding organizations. And then we have a series of advisory boards. And so these advisory boards have where the majority of the healthcare community has been working with us. And the fact that uh, we have a clinical excellence, which is made up mostly of doctors, we have financial a finance a sustainability committee, which is made up of the CFOs and, and finance people. We have the um, technology committee, which is made up of technology uh, CIOs, and they're participating in that. And then we have a small practice advisory group, which is made up of primary care physicians, uh, mostly, that are focused on our attendance smaller, so help us with the REC stuff. And then we have, obviously, the CRIS staff, which, which we are a small group, uh, kind of coordinating all this stuff, stuff together and working as collaboratively as, as you possibly can imagine. This is a highly collaborative uh, working step by step with state and federal agencies to get this done. So we went through a procurement process. It took almost eight or nine months to get that through. We wrote an RFP. We went through a whole series of demonstrations of what the technology partners could do. Uh, we went against best practices for what an HIE's capability should be. We, uh, we walked through all that. We used our technology committee, uh, w those other organizations, uh, to help guide us. Uh, to make that selection process. So this wasn't a, just a crisp making the choice. This was uh, those healthcare uh, exit, um, professionals who are in the industry who know uh, what the impacts on their organizations are going to be too, uh, working with the MHCC, and then went through a selection process that was highly collaborative. And basically, in the end, obviously, we wanted to build a structure that has 
these types of connectivity uh, capabilities. And that we, want to have, we don't have public health in here, but uh, public health has become one of those things that has definitely uh, popped up more in the short term for us. Uh, and I'll go through some of that pieces. But really, it's about uh, you know, connecting CRISP as <clears throat> the master patient index, the record lo lo locator service. And think about those things around the edges as our, kind of our edge devices. And so uh, we are a federated, decentralized um, clinical uh, actual data is being stored out at those edge devices. And the only things that come together is when you do, a, say, a query that knows who that person is and where those records are located and brings it dynamically back together and says, all right, here's a picture of Daniel Wilt as we know him today. And so as organizations want to participate or unparticipate, um, we, they could take their nodes off our network and, and basically they take our clinical stuff with them. We still know that there was, there was a record there, but we couldn't get to it anyway. So that, from our perspective, that makes a lot better sense because uh, commingling all the data together and if you have somebody not wanting to participate anymore, how to pull all that data back out is, is really complex. And so we are, are we're glad that we have a federated a distributed model because we think this is the, it makes it scalable, flexible, uh, and uh, be able to meet the needs of privacy, security, and the, the organizations actually own that piece of the puzzle so that it, that's their um, control of that piece. So one of the things that um, we actually went off and was, did a lot of work around and thinking was the master patient index. And so, you know, accurately, consistently linking identities together is obviously uh, somewhat complex. Uh, so if you get a series of ADT transfers, uh, HL7 messages into the, HL, or into the HIE, uh, we look through and go, all right, well, it gives uh, about 20 different pieces of information. We try to match those up. Uh, it can be de deterministic, which is, says all 20 have to match. Uh, if they all match, then that's the same person. Or it could be probabilistic and probably uh, match. Uh, and so uh, we did a lot of work with our technology vendor to run them through the ringer to say, well, which ones, which product is better? And we actually chose a separate product in our core HIE stuff because of the problem that probabilistic matching capabilities. And so where you get false, neg false positive, false negatives is really not good for a master patient index when you're talking about health information exchange. And so for us, uh, this is really important for us to make sure that we get this uh, together and right. And that's actually, was, I was talking with the Maryland AHIMA uh, uh, board last night, and they were bringing up great ideas about things that they deal with all day long. And they're like, well, how are you going to handle twins? I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. You know, twins, you know, baby Wilt gets born, and that information comes into your exchange, and then gets renamed uh, to uh, their permanent name or their first and last name they change. So those are the types of things that a master patient index has to really take care of and be able to match up so that you're not linking uh, important health information with the wrong uh, entity in that piece of it. So this is a huge piece we actually went through. And uh, our, our technology approach is Axolotl is a core infrastructure pieces. And we're using, we're going to be using the Initiate MPI solution, which is the Initiate one is, has that prob problemistic uh, capability. And it's really, uh, it, it is a far and above what the other product could do. So um, Axolotl has is 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 got uh, at least three, the, the four of the state HIEs. Uh, they've been in the business for quite a long time, um, and their product is, has been field tested uh, to the size of Maryland, uh, at least. So we know that uh, the population, 3.5 or so, we think we're getting about 5 million uh, entities into the ma master patient index in the end because we got bleed over from Delaware, from DC, and, and others. But we think of about 5 million at the end uh, is where we're going to get to. But um, we know that Exelos product can scale that far, which is important for us. Uh, to meet the needs of Maryland. So here's the types of data we, we are getting today. We get demographics, progress notes, problems, list medication, vital signs, the discharge summaries from the hospitals, immunizations, laboratory data, radiology reports, uh, and prescription information. And so these are the stuff that we worked on first. The Clinical Excellence Committee said to focus in on these first. Uh, they're looking at additional use cases, but these are the ones that we knew that we could get and we could also try to standardize. Uh, so for the actual exchange services, we get HL7, obviously, is the main transport uh, for standard that we get today, the ADTs, the ORUs, uh, all that stuff being uh, pushed into our edge, into their edge devices, and then being indexed, and then uh, through the master patient index. And then we also have some secure messaging and referral capability that's not turned on at this point, but we do have that capability to be able to do in the future. And we're looking at additional ways. And this is where the policy board helps us to understand what are the things that. Uh, within Maryland are acceptable and how we can then interpret those and implement the technologies that meet up with their policies. And so uh, this is an interesting thing where we 
help they help us understand where we can go uh, with the technology pieces. So we have three main uh, approaches today. We have the query capability, uh, which is the ability to go to the master patient index, search on Daniel Wilt, dynamically brings that together. There's a second one, which is a push, uh, which is I've ordered a, a lab. The lab actually has a result, and it'll come through our system and actually push back over to, say, a physician's EHR. And then third, there's a subscription model, which says, I know Daniel is a very sick person. He, I'm treating him. I want to subscribe to him. So anytime he has any clinical information, alert me to that fact. And so if I'm going to the hospital and I have my primary care physician, I would get a notification that said, oh, Daniel went to the hospital. He's been admitted. Um, that just is another way for you to be able to uh, keep track of a, a patient that, that may be uh, using a lot of health services. So in, in Maryland, we're an opt-out state. So uh, you have to, we, everyone is participating in those organizations. So your data is being flowed into those edge devices. And then at the CRISP level, uh, uh, a consumer can call us, fax us, go online, uh, and opt out of the system. So they can only opt out of certain things. So they can opt out of subscription and, and query. They cannot opt out of the push. Uh, the reason you can't opt out of the push is if the physician orders that lab, we need to deliver it uh, and it's part of your healthcare uh, pieces. And so uh, we're centrally controlling this. So uh, through, the, through our uh, uh, participating organizations are telling you that they're participating in the HIE, uh, they'll give you information about how, what the CRISP is. They'll tell you you can opt out of it, uh, and, but you have to actually call us directly. And so if you, uh, right now is a model of if you want to opt out, you opt out of everything. And it's a one opt out for all of Maryland. So whatever participating hospitals or organizations, if you opt out at the central level, you're out of, for everything. Not to say that you can't opt back in. You can opt back in right away, and we'll, we'll set you right back up. Uh, and then we, get, we do get some questions around the do you store any data about somebody who's opted out? Well, we have to have some data to know that we should be opting you out. So we do store some crit critical information that says, if we get more information from another participating one, this person is not uh, searchable or subscribable. So we do keep some data about you as minimal as we possibly can to make sure that, that we don't uh, overstep their privacy. So in Montgomery County, we went live with five of the hospitals. And then we have also have other participants from LabCorp Quest, Community uh, Radiology, Advanced Radiology, and American Radiology. And today, all that stuff is being flowed into those edge devices. Um, and so the value of the HIE is only really valuable until you get data in it. So that's part of our dilemma is that as we connect up the rest of the, 46, or the 41 hospitals in the state of Maryland, we need some time to actually have that populate before it really becomes a value to somebody else. And so in Montgomery County, we've been live since September. Uh, and so we've been collecting data and, and we've been, we have about, you know, I think 100,000 MPI matches and stuff, uh, but nobody's really using it per se. I mean, they're just putting data in. Uh, and so we're just about to create some uh, pilots and test cases around how to use the data in Montgomery County because uh, we also need the policy board to help guide us what is acceptable for Maryland to be able to do querying. So we have a couple of different ones we're proposing around the ED. It makes a lot of sense. If you go to an ED in Montgomery County, they should be able to find out if you've been admitted to somewhere else. And so there's some basic things that we're working through with the state, and it's important that the state uh, provide some guidance on this. So this is statewide. This is all the, the practices, hospitals, number of beds, population. So you can see, obviously, um, most of the hospital, most of the counties that only have one hospital, there's two counties that don't have a hospital at all, and then there's only four counties that have um, more than one. And so Montgomery, Prince George, Baltimore County, Baltimore City all have multiple hospitals. And so uh, we're tackling the first five that are in Montgomery County. I think we're, gonna, we're working with another 25 in different phases that we expect to get them connected up within the next six months. And <clears throat> if we get some of the larger system-based ones, we'll get a whole bunch at, at one point. So we're excited. Uh, we think we're going to be able to get that um, more than half of the hospitals in Maryland done uh, in the short term. We have another 18 months to get the rest of them done. So we committed to 20, in 24 months get all the hospitals connected. At the same time, we're trying to get to physician practice, which is really a much more difficult uh, problem. And that's more of my end of, on it from the REC perspective. Uh, working with uh, small practices and getting connected is, is definitely a, a a difficult piece. Um, oh, we'll just skip. Right, you know, let's we'll skip right to the um, to the public health one that we're talking with Maryland. So the Department of Mental Health or Department of Health and Mental Hygiene uh, is looking to use Chris infrastructure that the state's already invested in to use as a single pipe to be able to get these labs 
into uh, into them. So they're able to, to receive HL7 messages today. They have a couple uh, laboratories that are actually doing this. Uh, and then the majority of the hospitals and everywhere else are doing it in various different ways. And so uh, they're not consistent. How they get done is different in each of those organizations. So they're looking towards us and the fact that the state's invested in this technology that they should leverage us and make sure that we could deliver those. And so we're working with uh, some of those organizations to be able to flag those labs and have those be coming to us and then be routed over to, to DHMH and just have them as another repository. They're just another edge device on our node. Uh, and, and this is great architecture because of the fact that we can just start adding nodes and if there's other additional ones that we need to do it for other purposes that we didn't originally dream up, uh, this is a good one where public health can just tap into our architecture uh, because it's, of its flexibility. And so we think this is an important one uh, from a short-term uh, piece of it because we think we can truly get this done uh, and then I think we, we can add consistency and, and uh, standardization to it. And so uh, we're excited about that one. On the more of the longer term piece is that, you know, as you start creating the community health record, as we get more and more data about all of Maryland, uh, we don't want, like, CRISP doesn't want to be the uh, right of a patient portal that writes on, to, on top of their, our infrastructure. We don't want to be in the game of creating uh, analytics on top of this data uh, because we just know that we're probably not going to be the, the best and smartest and, and, and be cr most creative. We think the free market free market's going to take a look at the data and they're going to go, wow, I can apply this engine to this and go off and, and do certain things with it. Or you may have disease specific uh, portals that people want to sign up with consumers that will, could leverage our technology, but we don't want to actually, we just want to be the pipeline and collecting of it uh, because we think uh, those other innovative ideas are going to come out and they're going to tap into this in appropriate ways that the policy board will help us understand where we can do this. And basically uh, we're, we're going to have uh, a continuous evolving pieces of the public health, obviously that, that uh, they're excited about getting uh, access to the information in long term because of the fact that they can then do uh, really population based analysis, which is something that's really difficult today. Um, and so we're excited about that. We think that um, there is going to be, we're, we'll tap into the, uh, provide those services available. So whether it's web services that they can securely connect into, be able to do some analysis over top of us. Uh, we think that's where we're going to play a game and really want to be flexible and, 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 and non-competitive in that, that arena because we think it's, uh, there's going to be some great ideas that pop out that we're not going to be the leaders in. Uh, so from that perspective, we think this is a really, uh, when I talk to public health, I, the RAC program, uh, we spent uh, two days with a whole bunch of public health people from across the country, and they were excited. Um, and so when you tell public health people about what we're, kind of gold mine we have, they just get really excited. And so uh, when you get excited people, you get good ideas and you get good uh, results typically. So um, in, in summary, the, you know, the value, obviously, uh, we think the HIA is, is going to make things uh, more efficient, uh, better access to stuff. Um, and so inside of Maryland, we're excited about uh, being the statewide HIE and also the REC program. Uh, we actually uh, will be working uh, with one of the areas that in healthcare that typically doesn't uh, get a lot of attention is long-term care. That's one of the areas that we're uh, an additional thing from the HIE perspective we'll be diving into in the short term. And so uh, we're excited about that and, and glad that, to be able to come talk to you today. And I'll be able to take questions uh, at the end. Well, thank you very much both to uh, uh, Mr. Wilt and Dr. Olova for a really interesting presentation. Uh, I realize that we have gone well past the normal time for this. We are doing the full hour, as I mentioned, so we'll be here till 1.30. Uh, so for those of you who are online and do uh, wish to send in questions, the email address again is maphtc at jhsph.edu, that stands for Mid-Atlantic Public Health Training Center. Um, and at this point, thank you both very much for uh, uh, being here. And so let me just turn to the audience to begin with and ask if there are any questions in the audience. Madam. Uh, so we're looking at the numbers of um, public health um, systems that are out there, 70,000 number. Do you see uh, any sort of, I mean, are we basically looking at the number and saying we have to connect all those separately, or are you seeing kind of a push to have a more standardized systems across maybe the same type of um, public health agency? And so if I can just repeat the question for the uh, online audience, the question was, uh, of those 70,000 uh, siloed systems that Dr. Orlova mentioned, 
Um, what does she think is the future of that kind of uh, architecture given what's happening in the rest of the world? I think on, on, to answer this question, we have to first ask the question why these systems has been created, have been created, and why so many of them. And if within public community they've been created to support activities or operations of particular programs, which will continue just to uh, operate in the future, that all these 70 systems has to be connected. It is for public health community to decide what systems to leave and what system to be replaced. However, it is for IT community and informatics community to help public health uh, professionals it's just to connect whatever number of system it is through standardization. Um, standardizing these legacy systems will not be easy, but the issue is today we have such a um, limited participation of, of public health professional in informing the development of HIT standards that I don't see when we will be able to connect these systems if we will not train informaticians with a standards uh, understanding of standards and the business needs on public health side just to bring this interest into standardization process. It could be done, it's been done through the Health Information Technology Standards Panel when we work on standards harmonization for maternal and child health use case, which we try to integrate vital registration, maternal, uh, newborn screening, blood testing and hearing, and EPSDT, all this stuff, it could be done. The issue is participation. And, and to answer for, for Maryland, actually, we're the uh, public health officials are participating with uh, CRISP inside the MAC MECC's policy board and then other conversations we're having with them. So they're highly engaged. And so uh, from a Maryland perspective, we're they're at the table. We're excited about having them there. And so uh, they're helping guide a lot of our discussions uh, from a policy board perspective and what is acceptable for Maryland to how we use the data that we're collecting. So. And again, the uh, uh, online uh, address for email questions is maphtc at jhsph.edu. Um, uh, let me ask the two of you uh, one question which just runs implicitly through both of your presentations, which is the sort of legal question about ownership of the data, especially as you begin to think about uh, accessing data. If you think about uh, the legal structure here in Maryland for public health surveillance, does specifically identify certain kinds of data that is automatically supposed to be reported to the department. And that would include, for example, reports of specific communicable diseases or cancer diagnoses. But if you start talking about um, uh, issues like cholesterol, for example, which is not specifically mentioned, um, and Daniel, I think this is a question for you uh, perhaps first, which is, uh, have we thought about the legal framework under which you might access population cholesterol data without necessarily having to enact a law uh, to do so? And who makes that decision? Uh, so for Maryland, uh, th that kind of would go to our MECC policy board. And so the policy board would then say, what are the use cases by which the public health officials can access that type of cholesterol or you know, any other uh, quality improvement type stuff, and so uh, they actually they sit on the policy board too, and they've been uh, they've been advocating for that capability. Uh, so from our perspective, it, it's really we're letting the state help drive those pieces of the puzzle. Uh, we are will be the technology enabler of how that gets done, but we're really look towards them to help guide us into what is acceptable for Maryland. I think obviously they are excited about the fact that they could do cholesterol and or diabetes or you name the the quality. Uh, piece that's hitting the Maryland, uh, quality pieces are hitting Marylanders every day. And if they could design programs to help reduce those, uh, could they make the overall health uh, of the of Marylanders better? Uh, and I think they would say they want to do that. And so we're looking for ways that we are able to do that in appropriate ways that protects privacy or security. As it, is it de-identified information that helps to get some things going that way? Uh, that definitely is, a, is a, an option. And then if you want to get to the identifiable pieces, uh, there's a set of things from the policy board that they're helping us understand how they could use it. So that's kind of what's happening in Maryland. Thanks so much. Uh, Anna, did you want to comment on that? I do want to comment. I hope very much that um, uh, things that's going on here, in fact, are done under the um, uh, strong enforcement of the jurisdiction-specific regulation. 
and uh, we with well, this some um, examples of leaks of information through Twitter, through Facebooks, and others. Uh, the last thing we want to hear is that regional health information exchanges also becoming vulnerable to this kind of leaks. So to me, um, the question is, we're looking for cholesterol levels on the um, regional level. Why do we need this information? What are we going to do about it? Okay, publish the um, peer-reviewed journal publication. Try to reduce this cholesterol level by giving those who need to be treated certain medication. Why are we collecting this data? I think these questions we're often forgetting to ask, serving as a just like, give me more data, give me more data, and I will try to figure out what I will do with them. I think um, enforcement of regulation uh, is uh, absolutely critical. Technically, this is no-brainer. We can get this information just in no time, and Chris will help you with that. It, I think it should be a decision of the um, uh, consumers, patients, on which information they would like to make public or not. And I am happy to hear that CRISP offers these opportunities of opt-out or opt-in. You started this question with the ownership of the record. This is not a solved problem. I've heard that there were discussions at the HIT policy committee that works under the Office of National Coordinator, but I never uh, saw the closure of uh, these discussions. I hope that I will see the day when the electronic medical record will belong to me as a patient, not to the provider and not to the hospital that is open payer. It should be consumer-centric operation, then we all will be also responsible to maintain, maintain it safe. Thank you very much, Dr. Olova. So this is a conversation, obviously, that is going to continue for uh, uh, quite some time. And I want to stress something that I think both uh, Dr. Olova and Mr. Wilt said, uh, which is that it's vitally important for the public health community to be involved in these discussions. And it is the greater public health community, uh, not just those of us at the Department of Public Health, but the entire public health community, including the uh, academic public health community, uh, needs to be talking about the use case and the and the importance of public health considerations in this uh, discussion. Uh, I want to close by thanking Molly Mitchell, who uh, put this program together for the Mid-Atlantic Public Health Training Center and the uh, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health for, again, hosting this uh, program and the continuing series of Grand Rounds. Uh, and we'll be back again next month uh, with another of the Grand Rounds. So thank you very much on behalf of the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and thanks to both of our presenters. Thank you. Thank you.